His scrupulous God wariness and generosity. Ibn Abi Khaythama narrated from Sulaiman Ibn Abi Shaykh Abu Hanifa was extremely scrupulous and generous. The biographies all report that he was particularly generous to his students and supported those of them who were in need, most notably Abu Yusuf. Ismail ibn Hamad ibn Abi Hanifa said that his father, Hamad, said, When my father died, we asked Al Hassan ibn Amara to undertake his ritual washing. After he did, he said, May Allah have mercy on you and forgive you. Abu Hanifa. You did not eat except at night for 30 years, and your right side did not lay down at night for 40 years. You have exhausted whoever comes after you. The author of Nuzhat al-Majalis mentioned that one time Abu Hanifa received some merchandise. Merchant came to him looking to buy it for a certain amount. Abu Hanifa said, wait until the sun rises. In the morning, other merchants came to him looking to buy it for a higher amount than the former merchants. He said, I have made the intention to sell it to others. Trials of the Imam Ali ibn Ma'bad said on the authority of Obeid, Abdul, Obeid Allah ibn Amir al-Raqi ibn Hubayra told Abu Hanifa to undertake the judgeship of Kufa and he refused. So he had him lashed 110 times, 10 times a day for 11 days, but still he refused. When he saw this, he let him go. Sheikh Wahbi Jawzi mentioned in his biography of Abu Hanifa that the Imam underwent four fitnas. The first and second were with the Khawarij, the third with the governor of uh, Governor Ibn Hubayra in 130, and the fourth with Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, who imprisoned and tortured him, then released him under house arrest until his death in Baghdad. His incessant worship and nickname of Pillar. Ibrahim ibn Rustum al-Marwazi said, four of the Imams that recited the entire Quran in a single raka'ah, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu, Sa'id ibn Jubair radiallahu anhu, and Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi. Among those who completed a khatma in every 24 hours were Mujahid, the great Quranic commentator. Ali ibn Abdullah al-Bariqi al-Azdi, Sa'id Sa'ad ibn Ibrahim ibn Abdurrahman ibn Auf al-Zuhri, Habib ibn Abi Thabit, the Tabi'i, the Sufi Sheikh ibn Khafif al-Shirazi, and others. Like the two, imam, the, like the two imams al-Bukhari and al-Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa reportedly made 60 complete recitations of the Qur'an every Ramadan, one in the day and one in the night besides his teaching and other duties. Al-Nawawi in At-Tibyan fi Adab Hamalat al-Qur'an cites among those who completed three or four khatmas every day and or night were Sulaim ibn Itar the Qadi of Cairo under Muawiyah as narrated respectively by Ibn Abi Dawood and Abu Umar al-Kindi and Abu al mughira Mansur ibn Zadhan al wasiti died 131, while Ibn al-Katib Abu Ali al Hussein or al Hassan ibn Ahmad died 340, is reported to have completed eight khatmas in every 24 hours, four in the day and four at night. And this is the most that was ever reported. Ibn Mubarak said Abu Hanifa for a long period prayed all five prayers with a single ablution. It is also reported that he prayed the dawn prayer with the same ablution as the night prayer for over 40 years, as did Malik, Sulaiman, Ibn Tarqan, al taymi and others. As, as Suyuti relates in 
جزاك الله خير محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد بسم الله The Muatta of Imam Malik Ta'ala is often described as the leading work amongst the famous hadith collections, even preceding in some ways that of Al-Bukhari. The Imam wrote his Muatta in response to a request by the Abbasid uh, Caliph Al-Mansur who solicited a work of authority on the ahkam of Sharia that were founded in authentic Sunnah. <clears throat> The Imam revised and consolidated his work many times and it is said to have taken him 40 years to complete. The classification of its contents are organized in an, or in an order that is typical of the works of fiqh, which is why it is sometimes identified both as a, as a, as a work both of fiqh and hadith. The third century hijrah marked yet again a new phase of development in the documentation of hadith, one of the distinctive features of the writings of this period was to isolate the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, from the sayings of the companions عنهم, and the fatawas of the learned figures amongst the followers. رحمهم, the earliest works of this period were the Musnad of Abu Dawood at Taylasi um, and then the much larger work of that genre, uh, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Uh, hadith writers during the third century on the whole observed the principles of Usul al-Hadith that had already gained recognition and the methodological guidelines that were developed were consequently put into effect. By the beginning of the 4th century, writers drew, drew a clear distinction between the a sound or sahih hadith and a defective or a mu'allal hadith. Then came the period of the mutaakhirun or a latecomers of the hadith writers, which marked the beginning of reproductive writings, glosses and commentaries on existing works that were authored by the pioneers or the mutaqaddimun of the hadith literature. Hadith literature, the major collections. The different stages of development in the compilation of hadith and their classification may be summarized under 10 headings as follows. It may be said at the outset, however, that these categories are not exclusive in that they tend to overlap and are in any case meant to be used as aids as to better understanding of the vast literature of hadith. The hadith literature has thus been classified as follows. The Sahifa, i.e. booklet collections, which marked, as already discussed, the earliest stage of in the documentation of hadith. At this stage, a hadith were simply put together in writing, often for the purposes of personal use, without any order or classification. This period actually started during the lifetime of the Prophet وسلم, and continued until the early second century and is generally known as the Sahifa period. The Musannaf collections manifested in the second stage in the development manifested the second stage in the development of hadith literature. Unlike the Sahifa collections, which were not classified, the Musannaf, i.e., classified, consisted of thematic classification of hadith. Starting at about the middle of the second century during this stage, hadith belonging to particular themes were classified under separate titles and chapters. Famous in the Musannaf category are the Muwatta of Imam Malik, the Musannaf of Ma'amar ibn Rashid, and the Musannaf of Abdul Razak ibn Humam as sanani The Musnad, a supported compilation, marked the next stage in the documentation of hadith and signified a stage wherein greater attention was paid to the chain of transmit, transmission or isnad which linked the hadith of the, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the reports of reliable narrators that usually started with a companion radiallahu anh. All hadith that were narrated by one companion radiallahu anhu, regardless of the subject matter, were put under his or her name. The main purpose of the Musnad writing was obviously to compile the largest num possible number of hadith for the sake of preservation and record. All hadith that were transmitted by particular individuals on any subject were put together without much attention to the classification on the basis of subject matter. This stage is considered as, as the richest of all. It began during the later half of the second century and famous 
in this category was the Musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, which contains 40,000 ahadith, including 10,000 repetitions reported by about 700 companions. It was derived from a much larger mass of 750,000 ahadith, and it took the Imam some 20 years to compile. Even then, the work was unconsolidated and in separate parts until the Imam's son, Abdullah, consolidated the work to which he also added some of his own findings. The other works in this category are the Musnad of Ibn al-Najjar and the Musnad of Abu Dawood, Sulaiman bin Dawood al-Taylasi and many others. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, bismillah. Here we can distinguish the following steps which led to the preparation of the suhuf. Zayd was introduced by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to collect, it, oh, Zayd was instructed by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to collect the Quran. Zayd collected it from various written material and the memories of people. The sheets thus prepared were kept with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, then Umar radiallahu anhu, then Hafsa radiallahu anha the masahif of the companions. There are numerous indications in the literature of hadith that several of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ had prepared their own written collections of the revelations. The best known among these are from Ibn Mas'ud Ubayd bin Ka'ab and Zayd bin Thabit A list of companions of whom it is related that they had their own written collections include the following Ibn Mas'ud, Ubayd bin Ka'ab, Ali, Ibn Abbas, Abu Musa, Hafsa, Anas bin Malik, Omar, Zayd bin Thabit, Ibn Az-Zubair, Abdullah bin Amr, Aisha, Salim, Um Salama, Ubayd bin Omar, bin Omar radiallahu anhum. It is also known that Aisha radiallahu anha and Hafsa radiallahu anha had their own scripts written after the Prophet ﷺ had died. The following is a very brief description of some of the masahif, which are attributed to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. All the information is based on classical sources. The, the Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud. He wrote a Mus'haf in which Surah 1, 113 and 114 were not included. Ibn al-Nadim, Nadim, uh, however, said that he had seen a copy of the Qur'an from Ibn Mas'ud, which did contain Al-Fatiha, Surah 1. The arrangement of the Surah differed from the Uthmanic text. The following is the order attributed to Ibn Mas'ud's copy. The list is obviously incomplete. It contains only 106 Surah and not 110, as Ibn Nadim wrote. In Surah Al-Baqarah, which I take as an example, there are a total of 110 variants. Most of them concern spelling, some also choice of words, synonyms, use of particles, etc. Example, pronunciation. Ibn Mas'ud reads al-Baqira in the place of al-Baqara. Spelling, he reads kulama in, in place of kulama. Synonyms, he reads sal, seek or beseech in place of adu, beseech. Assuming that all these are reliable reports, the copy of Ibn Mas'ud anhu would then have been prepared for his personal use and written before all 114 surah were revealed. Nadim, who, who lived in the 10th century, 4th century Hijra, also added, I have seen a number of the Quran, of Quranic manuscripts which the transcribers recorded as manuscripts of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. No two of the Quranic copies were in agreement and most of them were on badly effaced parchment. This note indicates that the question of authentic manuscripts of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu needs to be treated with some caution. The Mus'haf of Ubayd bin Ka'ab. He wrote a Mus'haf in which two additional surah and another additional ayah were reportedly found. The order of the surah is again different from Uthman, 
radiallahu anhu as well as Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. The following is the order of surah in the copy attributed to Ubaid bin Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. Again, as in the case of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, above this list is incomplete and does not contain all 114 surah of the Qur'an. Ubay has a total of 93 variants in Surah Al-Baqarah. Very often, his readings are similar to those of, I of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. For example, he reads Al-Baqarah in 270 as Al-Baqirah. So does Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Jazakallahu khairin Muhammad. ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I'm going to leave now. <laughs>